Now I want to briefly discuss the issue of uh, tandem queues. Tandem queues means you are putting one queue after another. Okay. So here is a queue. So which has Poisson arrivals at rate lambda, and they are being served at exponential mu. All right. And the output, so whenever these uh, customers get out of the first queue, they get into another queue, which is another exponential server of rate mu 2, some other rate. Okay. So we are going to assume that lambda less than mu 1 and lambda less than mu 2. Mu 1 and mu 2 can, one of them can be bigger or smaller, I do not care, but both mu 1 and mu 2 should be greater than lambda. Okay. This is well modeled. I mean, this is well motivated in uh, practice because often when you go to renew uh, renew your passport or whatever, you have to first go to one queue where they check your documents and you then get out of the queue, get into another queue to, uh, you know, actually apply for the passport, right, or renewal of the passport or in the, to renew your driver's license or whatever it is. These kind of tandem queues are quite common as we know from practical experience. So, here we assume that any customer who gets out of the first queue instantaneously goes to the second queue. There is no time delay uh, in, in the intermediate. Okay? The moment uh, a customer or a packet gets out of the first queue, uh, he or she finds himself in the himself or herself in the second queue. All right? And both queues are uh, exponential servers of rates mu1 and mu2 respectively. We are going to assume that, see the first is an mm1 queue. All right? Uh, this is an mm1 queue. So, the first queue is an exponential server and the service times are independent of arrival times. All right. And the second queue, there is no delay and no delay between queues. Between them. So, a customer who leaves the first queue instantaneously joins the second queue. Now, we are also going to assume that, so this is number 1, this is the second assumption, no delay between the queues. Third assumption is service times at the second queue. are independent of arrivals and service times at the first queue. Okay. So, the second queue is an IID exponential server, maybe I should say that also our IID exponential mu 2 and are independent of arrivals and service time in the first queue. Okay. So, if I am a customer, I had some uh, service time in the first queue and I get to the second queue, my service time in the second queue is statistically independent of my service time in the first queue or my arrival time in the first queue. Right? So, these are assumptions that I am going to make. So, what happens in this case, this system turns out to be fairly easy to analyze and that is because of Berg's theorem. Now, notice that the Departure process of the first queue, the first queue being an mm1 queue, the departure process is also Poisson of rate lambda, right? Poisson of rate lambda, correct? So, we are getting Poisson inputs to the second queue and the second queue also has exponential service rates, right? So, you may directly conclude that it is an mm1 queue, but we are not there yet because you have to argue that the service times in the second queue are independent of the arrival times in this process, right? In the arrival process to it, right? Now, we know that any given time t 
So we have to argue that there is no correlation between uh, the service times in the second queue and the uh, arrival process to the second queue, right? Now we know that the at any given time t, the arrival, the departure process is independent of uh, the state of the system of the first queue, right? And therefore, uh, you can argue that the arrival process here, right, at any given time t is independent of anything that happened in this system, all right? Also, by assumption, the service time here is independent of the service times here, correct? So, we can argue that the arrival process is independent of the service time in the second queue, right? So, you can argue that the second queue is a name one queue in a legitimate way. So, we are going to say now that So, let us say x t is the number of customers in first queue and y t is the number of customers in second queue at time t. So, we know that x t at time t is independent of departures from first q prior to t. All right. So, x t is independent of departures from first queue prior to t. This is because of Burke's. Right. This is because of Burke's theorem. Therefore, x t is independent of arrivals to the second queue before time t. Right. x t is independent of arrivals because the departures from Q1 prior to time t are in fact the arrivals to sec Q2 second uh, the second Q prior to time t, right? Depend of arrivals to second Q prior to t because there is not uh, we are not wasting any time waiting in between, right? Now y t. This is true for any t, right? Now, y t depends only on arrivals prior to t and services completed prior to t. right so yt so the number of customers in the second queue at any time t will depend on the arrivals that happened before t and all the services that happened before t we've already argued that the arrivals prior to t which are the departures prior to t from xt right so y of t is dependent only on arrivals prior to t which are independent of xt and services prior to t the service times prior to t which are also independent of xt right because xt the service times in the second queue are independent of the service times and arrival times in the first queue, right? So, both arrivals prior to t and the service t services completed prior to t are independent of xt and yt depends on only these two things, right? So, you can argue that xt and yt are independent random variables, right? Right? 
for any t. Right? So, we have argued two things. Right? First, that the second queue is also an MM1 queue. Right? Because you have Poisson arrivals and exponential services. And the second queue, the service times are independent of the arrival times. Uh, because the arrival times only depend on the service times and arrival times of the first queue, right? And which are independent of service times in the second queue, right? So we have argued that the second the second queue is also MM1, and we have argued that XT and YT, the state of the two systems, are in fact independent, right? So we can easily argue that uh, I mean, let us also assume that uh, we have you know, maybe we can, we can assume FCFS if if you want uh, things to be even simpler, right? So you have see what is now xt and yt are any independent are independent random variables. So you can argue that probably that xt equal to m and yt equals n, right? You can write as p xt equals m times p y t equals n, right? This is because of independence at any given time, right? And probability x t equal to m is nothing but uh, 1 minus rho 1, rho 1 to the m and probability y t equals n now uh, 1 minus rho 2, rho 2 to the n, where mu 1 and rho 2 is equal to lambda over mu 2, both are assumed to be less than 1. So, it is easy to find the joint distribution of x t and y t at any given time, right. It is just a product of the usual mm1 distributions. Next list, if you assume, so this so far everything we have said is valid in full generality, right. We have not assumed any FCFS. Now, if you assume FCFS, in both queues, now, now you consider a customer uh, who de departing q1 at time t, alright. Now, this the arrival time of this customer and therefore the total system, the, the time spent by this customer in Q1 is independent of departures prior to T, right. So, the total time spent by this customer is independent of departures prior to t, right. This is because of again Burke, Burke's theorem part c this is, right. Now, we are using FCFS and part c of Burke's theorem, right. So, we are saying that total sp time spent by the customer who departs at time t, departs q uh, q1 at time t is independent of departures prior to t and this departures prior to t are in fact the arrivals into the second queuing system, right. So, the time spent by this customer in the second queuing system, right, will be independent of the time spent by this customer in the first queuing system, right. This, this implies uh, time spent by the, by this customer. in the second queue is independent of time spent in by the same customer in the first queue. So, if you want to look at the total time spent by the customer in the first queue plus the second queue, it will be a sum of two independent random variables in the first only for FCFS, right.
So if you have FCFS, the customer who departs the first queue at time t, the total the system time in in q1 alone is independent of departures prior to t, right? But the departures prior to that customer uh, when the customer joins the second queue will determine his waiting time in the second queue, right? But we know from Berg part c that the departures prior to t t are independent of uh, the customer's total time in the first queue, right? So, the time spent by the customer in the first queue is independent of the time that the customer will spend in the second queue, right? So, the total time spent by the customer in Q1 plus Q2 will be a sum of two independent random variables. That is what this part is saying using Burke's theorem part C. We already know that the time spent by a customer in an M1 queue is an exponentially distributed random variable with parameter mu minus lambda, right? So, what happens is the first when the customer enters the first queue, she spends exponential amount of time with parameter mu1 minus lambda and then goes to the second queue and spends an independent exponential time with parameter mu2 minus lambda and then leaves the system. And then you can if you want you can add one more queue, you can add a third tandem queue and all these arguments will repeat, right. So, you have that. Uh, if you have a whole bunch of tandem queues with uh, exponential service times, right? You have you can make two important conclusions. The one is that, uh, well, maybe three important conclusions. The all of them behave like MM1 queues, independent MM1 queues, uh, in the sense that at any given time t, right? The joint distribution will be like a product of the corresponding MM1 queues distributions. Of course, the queuing processes are not independent, right? Because you can argue that if XT, uh, if, if there are never any customers in the first queues, of course, there won't be any customers in the second queue. It is not as though these tandem queues are like independent MM1 queues. That is not what I am saying. I am saying that at any given time t, the distribution products out, right? So, we can say this even for three, so three tandem queues or four tandem queues or whatever you want. And in the FCFS case, the total sp time spent by a customer in the first queue and then the second queue are independent. And you can add them up as independent random variables to get the total time spent in the system. And that is because of Berg's theorem part C. All right. So, this is quite powerful. See, there is one caution I want to give you that it is crucial. So, this independent service times in uh, two queues is very crucial, right? Uh, service times of each customer in different queues is very crucial. So, what we are saying is that if I spend a certain amount of time in Q1 and certain amount of time in Q2, I am assuming that these two random variables are independent. If this is not the case, then all of what we are saying will actually break down. Okay, let me show you uh, one example where the service times are not independent. I am going to show you a slightly, right, slightly extreme kind of an example where let us say they have two queues. Okay, I have Poisson arrivals of rate lambda, this is uh, exponential service of rate mu, I have another q, okay, also of rate mu, mu1 equal to mu2 let us say, right. Now, what I am going to say is that, so in this case, well, so far I have assumed that if I am a packet of some size here, right, and I take, I get served here for some time, I take an independent avatar so to speak in the second queue, right. So, what I mean by independent service times is that a packet or a customer in the first queue takes a certain amount of time and a second queue takes a certain different amount of time which is independent of the first, right. So, I do not retain an identity of the amount of service. So, for example, this could be justified. So, you if you are verifying documents in one counter and going to the next counter to you know renew your passport or whatever, 
this assumption could you know maybe it is justified right, but in a communication network this is not at all justified because I do not take different avatars right, I mean it is the same packet after all right, this, uh, this customer me is not a person going to a passport office, let us say I am a communication packet, right? I am like a packet of a certain size, then I am not going to take different avatars right. So, a packet which is small here will continue to be small here right, let us say a certain amount of bits and a packet which is fat will continue to be fat right. So, this is an extreme case where the identity, the amount of service time from one queue to another it is not only not independent, I am actually maintaining it to be the same ok. In this kind of a scenario, you cannot you know you cannot argue that Burke's theorem holds, Burke's theorem does not hold at all and in fact, the second queue will not be mm1, first queue is mm1 of course. Uh, so, where do things break down? So, the output process of this is still Poisson, right, because the output of an mm1 queue is always Poisson. And the second queue is of course, an exponential server, right. But I am arguing that in the case when these packets retain their sizes or identities or their service times, the second queue is not an mm1 queue and you cannot use Burke's theorem. Now, why is that the case? That is because there will be heavy correlation between the arrival process here and the size of the packet that is coming in, ok. In this case, let me write this down. In the above case, where the packets, I am now calling the customers as packets because I am saying they have a particular size, ok. So, the service times in the two nodes here, the two routers or whatever they are, are not independent, they are in fact the same, right. Well, the packets retain their retain the same size in the two queues cannot be analyzed using Burke's theorem. Why is that? Indeed, the second queue is not mm1, ok. The second queue will not be mm1 and you know why? See, the arrival process is pause on, the arrival process to the second queue is pause on and the service times are exponential, but the arrival times is not independent of the size of the packet that is coming, right. See, this is an important assumption in the mm1 queue. In an mm1 queue, what do we assume? The arrival processes are Poisson and the service time of each customer is independent of the arrival process is what we assume in an mm1 queue and that is not true here. You know why? Because, see, just think of what happens, right. Let us say I have some big packet. Okay, this is a big packet. Okay, this is let us say this is time, this is my time, and this is a big packet. Okay, he gets served in the first queue. So, this guy out here is getting served. Whenever he is getting slowly served, all right. So, when slowly this job is being eaten away by the first server, there will be a lot of other smaller jobs that would keep coming at rate lambda, right. So, when the first uh, job is getting served, there will be a lot of smaller jobs that would come to the first queue, right, I mean, typically smaller jobs. So, when you have an atypically large job that is sitting at the first queue, there will be a lot of small jobs that come. So, whenever the first, whenever the big file finishes service at the first queue and gets to the second queue, it will be immediately followed by a number of small packets, right. So, what does that mean, right? When I see a big packet, I can imagine that there will be number of arrivals after that, uh, you know, in, in succession in the for the second queue, right. So, what uh, what we are saying is that uh, 
uh, there is no I mean if you look at the size of the, the arrival process to the second queue still pause on. But if I look at the file, if I see a big file, right, I can, I will know that there will be a lot more uh, smaller files that come after that, right. Uh, that is because they have been waiting behind this big file. Uh, so, this kind of, uh, this is somewhat like, you know, I did not make this very precise. Uh, it is somewhat like, you know, if you have a big truck moving on a small road, there will be a number of cars behind it, right. This is like a slow truck effect because all these cars have just come and started waiting behind the truck because the truck is moving very slowly, right. Something like that happens out here, right. You can simulate this and see if you wish. And uh, I was not very, uh, very mathematically precise, but this is exactly what happens. So, there, there is a correlation between the sizes of the files and their arrival times. That is what happens in the second queue. So, although the arrival process is pause on, it is not an MM1 queue. That is because there is a correlation between the sizes of the files and the ar arrival process. So, in fact, this kind of a tandem queue cannot be analyzed under Burks and may not be easily analyzed at all, right, because there is such a strong correlation between the file sizes and the arrival process. So, this is not an easy process to analyze. So, this is a word of caution that this Burks theorem should be used very carefully, right. It crucially depends on the service times in the two queues being independent random variables. Another word of caution is that um, if you have cycles, this sort of breaks down, right. Let us say, so if you have tandem queues where one queue's output is feeding the other, and the service time and the second output is independent of the first and the second output is feeding the third one where again there is independence across service times. Then you can use Burke's theorem tandem queues analysis, then you will have independence of uh, the state and all that. But the moment you start feeding back, so feed forward is perfectly okay, if you have feed back, so, if the output of one queue feeds back into its own input or another queue's input, then you will have trouble. Let me show you. Let us say feedback. Let us say I have this queue. So, I have an arrival process of poson rate lambda. They enter the system and they get served and then I split, ok. What do I do? I split a fraction of 1 minus q and q. With probability q, a served customer departs the system and with probability 1 minus q, a served customer joins the, joins the q again, instantaneously joins the q. So, I complete service, I toss a coin independently across other, so this q can be thought of as a coin toss. So, I toss a coin, moment I finish service, I toss a coin, uh, if it turns out like with probability q, I leave, with probability 1 minus q, I instantaneously join back the q, alright. And this q, this coin toss process is independent of everything else, independent of the arrival process, service process and it is independent across customers and so on, okay. So, in this system, it is a little bit problematic, okay. This is not really an MM1 q. Why if you, if you look at this, let us say if mu is much, much bigger than lambda and let us say q is much, much smaller than 1, okay. Then what happens is that a customer would come, let us say the system is empty, a customer would come, right, lambda is much smaller than mu, so mu is very fast. So, you would get served, but it is very high probability the, the customer will come back and again get served and come back, again get served and come back, right. And after maybe, uh, let us say if q is 0 0.01, then I would come back about 99 times, right, and the 100th time I would leave, right. So, the timeline would come like a customer comes, very well, 99 times he comes back and goes. And after a very long time, a new exogenous arrival will come, right, again the same thing sort of thing will happen, right. So, if you look at the process here is poson, right, that is what we know is poson. But the process here is not poson, it would be very bursty, right. So, the process that is actually entering the queue is not at all poson because it will have a number of repeated entries and then nobody, the number of repeated entries and nobody and so on. So, it is not a poson input to the queue at all, right, in this scenario.
but if you you can there's a way to analyze this kind of a system if you put it inside a box let's say you put it inside a box like so right now the if you look at the markov chain corresponding to the custom number of customers inside this box this 1 minus q the customer joining back will not it's like a self transition and will not be seen as a change in the state of the system at all right so the markov chain for the number of customers inside the box will still look like it's like birthday chain except the rate at which this will be like mu q assuming that mu q is less than 1 and this can be made into a positive recurrent chain let's assume that mu q is less than 1 mu is very large uh, compared to lambda and q is very small but mu q is less than 1 and so on right dot 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 so the state of the system inside this box still behaves like it's an mm1 q with parameter lambda over mu q as the row factor right so the number of so if you look at xt as the number of customers in the system it will still satisfy 1 minus rho times rho to the i where rho is equal to lambda over mu q all right although the q itself forget the box now if you look at the q itself it's not at all an mm1 q it has burst arrivals right because the same guy keeps coming back but nevertheless it's a markov process that we can very well understand as a birthday chain and you can solve for its occupancy probability okay so that is just uh, i mean it's uh, an interesting system to consider so anyway so you can you can think of this uh, now that we have studied tandem queues where you feed forward and you can consider them as uh, not as independent mm1 queues but any given time they behave like they are independent mm1 queues and then you have these queues with feedback so you could potentially even take with probability p i take the output of q1 and send it to q3 with probability some other probability i send it to q4 and blah 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 i can make a big network of queues like this where there are some exogenous inputs some uh, departures which leave the system for good but some departures get routed from one queue to another queue with some probability and so on these kind of systems can be studied they are known as jackson networks okay and that will be the topic of our discussion in the next module so i'll stop here thank you